thank you very much, Yankai, uh, for welcoming me. Uh, I'm very I'm delighted to be in front of you today, as a time, to speak about one very difficult topic. And uh, Yang Kang Chen used to always ask me difficult tasks. So <laughs> today uh, it's a more difficult task. So why coping with such a topic? I think that the main reason is that, in fact, I don't believe that sarcopenia is a stand-alone disease, as too often it was said. I think that sarcopenia is dependent of the aging process. And I don't think that basic knowledge in aging muscle structures and connections is very important to determine the new therapeutical targets. So to cope with these difficult topics, I propose you first to remind you the main characteristic of the muscle, the skeletal muscles, and then to try to show you the fully investigated aspect of muscle aging and sarcopenia before leaving you with a message. So, firstly, to remind you what is muscle. The, in human, Skeletal muscle tissue represents approximately 40% of the total body weight, contains more than 50% of all the body proteins, accounts for more than 30% of the whole protein turnover, and indeed, in catabolic condition, skeletal muscle tissue serves as an important protein reserve. So, in human, skeletal muscle tissues are very important because they allow us to have locomotion, a nice metabolism, blood health, and neuromuscular function. So, if you are taking a muscle and you are looking at this muscle, it is composed by multiple fibers, and these multiple fibers compose two kinds of cells. The first and most, most important are probably the muscle fiber, which are post metabolic and multinucleated. And you can see how many nuclei they have on this kind of fiber. And then there is another kind of fiber close to the post metabolic fiber, which are called the satellite sites, which are the stem cells of the skeletal muscle. And they are absolutely necessary to regenerate, repair, and remodeling, remodel the muscle age. So, if you are taking only the fever itself and look at the composition of the fever, you can see that the fever has a lot of nuclei, and these nuclei are very important to coordinate and control the synthesis of protein. They are, they are also sarcoplasmic reticulum, which used to be the storage, release, and reuptake of the calcium. Then there is the transversal tube within the sarcomere reticulum, which is very important to conduct the nerve action and to put it into the cells. And it is something that we will see later. We have mitochondria, which generate the energy for the muscle action with when oxygen is available. We have a lot of capillary supply network, and we have stem cells. And stem cells are also very important, as we will see later. Indeed, I will not forget that this kind of muscle fiber contains thousands of Myofibril, and this myofibril com have, is composed, are composed by billions of myofilaments. And the myofilaments are gathered together as a sarcomere, which is the basic contracted unit. And the basic contracted unit are also include also very thin uh, components, which are the myosin and six components, which are the active. 
So it was only to remember how Pascal was in this competition. So within the fiber, you have mainly two kinds of fiber, fiber type one, which are slow, oxidative, and fatigue resistant. And you have also fiber type 2A, which are fast, oxidative, and acting for different kinds of, of metabolic properties. But what is important is the presence of fiber which are different properties within the same muscle. And it is only linked to the fact that there is a need, there is a need of adaptation to various mechanical and metabolic demands. So when you are looking at the process of differentiation and activation of the fiber, you have to think about, firstly, the capillary supply network, to have to think about the energy production, and release, and also to think about the peripheral nerves. And I will try to cope with three topics in the next minutes. So, the first one is the capillary supply network. And this capillary supply network is very important because it will support the mechanism, uh, the mechanical and metabolic demands depending on the muscle activities and the muscle uh, fiber type. But as you can see on this slide, you have different types of, of fiber. You have the, myo, the, the nucleus, the nuclei. You have the active satellite site on green, the capillary. And you have this kind of young or capillary impact zone, which is also very important to consider. And I will show you why later. So indeed, when you have this kind of skeletal muscle, it is an active metabolic layer uh, tissue which requires oxygen, nutrients, growth factors via the vascular system and the microvascular system. So there is a very good relationship between the vessels, the capillary system, and the stem cell themselves. So if we are thinking now about the energy production, there is two fuels of this uh, muscle fiber, the carbohydrate, carbohydrate, and the fat. And indeed, another time, the selection of the fuel that will be used by the muscles depends on the intensity and duration of the exercise. And generally, uh, a light exercise, a high level exercise, it is muscle glycogen, and at low exercise, it is more the but when you are looking at uh, how it works and how the exc excitation and contraction of the muscle appear, you can say that firstly we have the first uh, first phase, which is the neural stimulation transmission, and indeed you have the ner uh, nerve action uh, nerve uh, action potential. We have indeed the recruitment neuromotor no, no unit, you have the muscular excitement. And if I show you how it works, you go in this way, then at the muscular, neuromuscular junction, you have, at that time, a calcium release linked to the couple exciting contraction unit, and you have this time activities within the sacrum, uh, sacrum reticulum, and then you have the interaction between actin and leucine, and it is the contraction of the muscle. So, I will show you another time this kind of excitation contraction coupling, which starts in this way this neuromuscular junction, release of calcium, and then, excuse me, and then contraction of the protein. So, it was only to remind you how the muscle works. And now I will try to show you what seems to me the poorly investigated aspect of this kind of muscle aging and sarcopenia. As I told you at the beginning, the muscles are a very important part of protein or composition in the body and are very important to consider. But, in fact, 
the muscle is also aging in different ways. If you are looking at the same kind of fibers that I showed you at the beginning, what are the changes with age? Firstly, you have a reduction of the muscle size and reduction of the fiber expressing mostly the fiber time 2. Then, we have a global reduction in the, of the myosin within the different kinds of fiber, the type 1 and 2. You have also reduction of the elasticity of the wall muscle that we will stick again in a few minutes. And we have different kinds of activities, which is firstly the fragmented sarcoplasmic reticulum that could impair the calcium release. Then you have reduction of the capillary system, I spoke of just before. You have loss and function of mitochondria, and you have a reduction of the number of satellite cells. So that is very important to consider because we will have touched a lot of aspects that are not really investigated until now. If I am taking the same uh, slide as before concerning the muscles, the main change after this uh, overview are composed by the description between the uh, head of the myosin, the myosin head, and with actin, and also there is an increased bridges between our uh, uh, actin and myosin, and there is also a change in the cross uh, bridges compliance. So, if now we are going ahead with what I think that are not really investigated when you are speaking of sarcopenia as one organ disease, it is a problem of the vascular capillary supply. And you, it is indeed uh, the consequence of aging is an impaired perfusion of the skeletal muscle fiber and also the satellite, satellite uh, cells, a limited delivery of oxygen, growth hormone, and nutrients into the fiber, and all these things impair negatively the ability of the muscle to respond to stimuli. Indeed, there is in cells we don't speak too much of it, which is the parasite cells, which is the periendothelial mesenchymal cell, which is residing within the microvascularity. And when you are looking at the parasite, parasite, as I told you, are linked to the microvascular system. And you can see this parasite in brown into this kind of image. And parasites are very important to consider because, firstly, they have a very important functional uh, homeostatic function. They are also very stimulated uh, to respond to injury, and they are also very active as a process to uh, respond to any disease. And more than that, these cells are very important because they are more and more considered as myogenic precursor cells. So we will have the satellite cells, and we have also another kind of cells, which are the parasites, which are able to have uh, uh, produce new cells into the muscle. So if you are comparing the young age muscles and the old age muscle, you can see that there is indeed a change in uh, the uh, type 1 and type 2 fever, mainly in type 2 fever. The satellite cells become quiescent after the growth, and then you have increase in the microvascular and vascular system. Plus, there is something which is important to notice, is that in fact, there is an impact on the capillary uh, zone. You can see when you are young, the stem cells, the satellite cells, the satellite cells are very well uh, vascular by uh, the, the, the capillary. But within the age people, the, the uh, satellite cells are not so well vascularized. So, which is important to consider is that there is a decrease 
between the relationship between the vessel capillary and also the stem cells, uh, the satellite cells, and also there is a decrease in the cross-stop between satellite cells and the vessels and parasites. So, the second point, which is not really uh, uh, touched until now in this kind of discussion, is the problem of the mitochondrial function. And mitochondrial function are very important, and indeed, there is a reduction of the quantity and the function of the mitochondria. And the consequences of this dysfunction and decreased number of mitochondria are the activation of apoptosis, there is a fever atrophy and necrosis, and indeed, deprivation of the muscle fever, alteration of the stability of the neuromuscular junction. So, it's very important to consider mitochondria and vascularization, and indeed, there is another point which is key, which is the role of the satellite cells. Satellite cells, as I told you at the beginning, are very important to renew the cells, or the, the, the multinuclear uh, nuclei and post nucleotic cells. And indeed, if you are looking at the aged skeletal muscle cell, firstly, you have to say that 60% of aged cells are severely compromised with, within their DNA integrity. More than that, we have the aged uh, muscle satellite cells, which decrease in number, their functioning is not so good, and their regenerative capacity is decreased. So, what we have to say is that, firstly, there is a decrease in the number of satellite cells within the aged muscles, which pass from 4% to 1%, and they are not very well functioning. So, why? And the question is, how is it possible to restore the function and role of the, these satellite cells? And the question is very important. Why the satellite cells are able to adequately respond to stress? And is it true? Is it a lack of appropriate muscle fiber perfusion, as I suggested before? Is it the impaired delivery of regular signal to the satellite cells, the question is completely open. And, in fact, this kind of study, recently published, shows that if you are transfusing serum from old mice to young mice, you will reduce the myogenic potential. But if you are doing the contrary, perfusing young or serum to old mice, you have improving, you improve the, 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 the regeneration of the muscle. And indeed, the main question is, is it true that there is inability of the satellite cell to answer to the stimulus? Or is it really true that there is a lack of inappropriate vascularization? We don't know. And in fact, we have to go to other factors which are known as the best inhibitors of the muscle growth, and particularly the myostatin, which are called GDF8, and another marker, which is the GF1. And in fact, myostatin is a protein synthesized and secreted by the skeletal muscle mass, and indeed, it negatively reg uh, regulates muscle mass, and indeed, it, it provokes of uh, the myopathic uh, tubes uh, atrophy. You have also the GDF1 element, which was very well known as being essential during the first embryonic phase of life, and it is called the bone mon uh, morphogenic protein element. And it is known for a few years that now this GDF element, decrease the stem cells and stem cells, decrease the muscle regeneration in vitro, and in vivo, decrease the lean mass. So, if we are looking at the GDF8 and the GDF11, they are very close together. They are very, they are similar composition. 
And it was very difficult to distinguish one to the other. And in fact, when you are looking at uh, carefully of them, it seems that they are acting in the aging process. But recently, it was possible to really differentiate GDA8 and GDA11 by a kind of uh, new technique, liquid chromatography with double uh, mass spectrometry. And what is very surprising, and with aging, you have an increase of the myostatin, while the level of GDF11 will stay quite the same, which is something very new to understand. When you are looking at uh, the literature and looking at the different dosage of GDF11, you can see that, in fact, sometimes it's a decline, sometimes it increases, sometimes it's no change. But, in fact, what is very important is that the techniques are not exactly the same. And, indeed, as they are not the same, the results are different. But there is another effect. The problem is that, in fact, GDF11 changed during the life period and life course. At the beginning, as I told you, it is called a morphogenic protein, very important at the embryonic phase. Then, decrease uh, with uh, aging, and it is at the, at the midlife, it is very low, and then in increase with pathology. And it seems that the increase of GDF1 element with, uh, uh, with aging is linked to disability and to pathology. So, if you are thinking of that this kind of hypothesis is true, if we have a, best, a better a low level of GDF1 element when you are aging, at that time, you will be able to stay healthy a long time and have very good function all along your life. So, another point which is very important to consider, which was already considered, which is the hormonal changes. And when you are looking at the hormonal network, linked to the muscles, you can see that there is two main uh, domains. The first domain is the anabolic cyclamus. And you can see on slide that you have a lot of degrees in IGF, uh, growth hormone, IGF-1, ghrelin, but also testosterone, estrogen, DHEA, which are very well known. But something which is also has to be in our mind is that there is not only a decrease of secretion, but there is also a decrease in the sensitivity of the receptors of this kind of hormonal change. And if we are speaking about anabolic goals, we have uh, signals, we are also to think about the anabolic or catabolic signals. And you can see that all of them are increased, and particularly we have an increase in cortisol and all the metabolism or metabolism of cortisol. You have an increase of pro inflammatory cytokines, uh, increase in antibiotic resistance, apparition of the rose, and also a lot of change in within uh, the uh, vitamin D and DHA party or more. So I think that it is something that we have to consider and which was already considered but not in the global overview. Another point which is more complicated is the problem of the brain muscle axis. Is there any brain muscle axis? Is there any modification of the mus neuromuscular junction? And in fact, it was very well known now in mice that in fact you have a decrease in the number of connection within the neuromuscular junction. We have an increase of neurodegenerative uh, musculo, neuromuscular junction. We have a decrease in alteration of the acetylcholine release, and after the, the synapse itself, or the junction itself, there is a poor synaptic stimulation of the myofibril. So all these things are acting and modifying deeply the way that the excitation and uh, of the contract, excitation contraction of the muscle appear in old age. And if I can show you what is happening, uh, for the first phase, you have a decrease, uh, probably a decrease in a uh, no change in the nerve action potential. You have a decrease, as I told you, of the motor units. You have a decrease and modification of the muscular excitement. And you have also a change 
because of the sarcoplasma retic and how sarcoplasmic is changed. And if you are trying to know how it works, firstly, probably the message active neuron message is slower. So when it arrives at the neuromuscular junction, it is uh, the second phase will start. The second phase will be also very low and disconnected. And the release of the calcium will be altered because indeed there is sarcoplasma reticulum which is the damage. And then the contraction of the actin myosin is very slow and mostly uncoordinated. And if I show you again this kind of sequence, you can see that how it works. More than that, now they are thinking, and more and more in 2019, they are saying that there is one brain muscle access, direct, direct access. And this is linked to this kind of synaptosomal associated protein. But I don't know it was only one hypothesis, but I think that it's more and more interesting to have this kind of data now. Another point is of the bone muscle unit. And when I welcome in my department in Geneva, one professor of bone metabolism, at the beginning I called him, but there is a link between muscles and bone. And, come, no, no, no. and now he's publishing the law from sarcopenia, indeed. But in fact, what is very uh, nice to know is that in fact there is a decrease in the tendinous stiffness, while the muscle increases stiffness, and there is also the infiltration of the muscle with fat. And this infiltration of the muscle by fat it go to 1.5 to 5%, perhaps in all person or secondary person, it increases and much more than that. And what is important to, to say is that it is that the, this kind of infiltration and this kind of change in the muscle thickness modify the force production and compromise the contraction speed. And if you are looking at the cross-talk between muscle and bone, you can see that uh, the muscle's secretum is very wide, with a lot of components which are acting on bone. But on the other way, a lot of uh, osteopans are acting on the muscle. And indeed, we have also to consider the chondrocyte. We have also to consider the deposite. And I will not speak too much about it because I know that my good friend Gustavo Duque will speak about this crosstalk and about this kind of relationship between bone and muscle later today. Another point which is very, um, very new and perhaps not perfect, but I think that I have to mention it to you, it is the dead muscle axis. And uh, this dead muscle axis is uh, something that is uh, something too new to be developed too much, but it's, you have to have it in mind. So, the NLC microbiota uh, is uh, um, allow that uh, the different uh, germs which are within the intestine go into uh, the blood, increase uh, the systemic, uh, the, the production of uh, and they have, so, so, so this microbial uh, microbe go to the, to the blood, produce this kind of host inflammation, modify the activities of the mitochondria, and the host inflammation plus, plus the dysfunction of mitochondria change completely the way of the damaged mitochondria act and also increase the number of cytokines and all this kind of metabolic six, and indeed, all of this increase the inflammation, cytokine, and also uh, different kind of markers which are increasing and the damaging, the, the damaging the muscle. So the new publication of this data shows that this kind of dysbiosis of the microbiota increase the permeabilities of the gut. In change completely uh, the microbiota and uh, allow the passage into the blood of um, microbial of microbe, then increase the pathology, increase the pathology of the muscles, and are the link between this kind of microbiota alteration and the muscle uh, abnormalities 
which lead to uh, uh, disabilities. So now I have to conclude my talk with a few take on this. The first one is that personally I think that sarcopenia is not a standalone disease, but I think that passive action action for child so us play well this at the beginning. And I think that it is not independent uh, of the aging process. We have to introduce it into the aging process. Secondly, I really uh, think that uh, the, it is important to know better the microstructures and the physiology of the muscle skeletal mass with aging. And the first so, so, so point is that we have to integrate this knowledge within the global aging process to find the better therapeutical strategies. And what are the strategies? We know quite well that exercise is acting. We are perfectly convinced that nutrition is very important. We know the role of vitamin D. We start to better know the role of uh, hormonal supplementation. But we have probably to work more on the vascular network expansion and more and more data are arriving in this way. And I think that the next speaker will better speak about uh, this kind of topic. We have to control the myostatin regulation and also to think about the G GDF element. We have to think about how we can stimulate uh, the stem cells and satellite cells. We have to know also that the pet side has some things that were was completely forgotten until now. We have to know if we have to do something about the gut microbiota restoration and how we can do it, and if any anti inflammatory drugs can be active in this kind of sarcopenia. Thank you very much for your attention.